over to the book of Revelation. We're looking at Revelation chapter 3, part 2 on the church at Laodicea, which is verses 14 through 22. Revelation chapter 3, verses 14 through 22. And unto the church, the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would that thou wert cold or hot, so then, because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Because thou sayest, I am rich. Oh, ye, ye, look everybody, rich. And increased with goods, and have need of nothing. And knowest not how stupid you are. Knowest not that thou art wretched, and miserable, and poor, and blind, and naked. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear. And anoint thine eyes with eye salve that thou mayest see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be thou repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him and will sup with him and he with me. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne even as I also overcame, and am set down with my Father in his throne. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Gracious Father, we pray that as we study your word tonight, that it will be the examiner of our hearts, so that we might know whether or not we fall into the category of the church of Laodicea. A dangerous category in which any church could find itself. We pray, Father, that you will open our hearts and our eyes to that which is true. And that if there is sin, we might repent. And that we might obey that each of us might open the door where we have shut Jesus out. It's an individual, not merely a church, statement that Christ makes. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him and will sup with him and he with me. It's an offer, Father, that we see if there is a, an apostate church, if, if there's a church that's gone the way of Laodicea, there will probably be many that never hear the knock, that never open the door, but an individual can hear it. And it will make a difference in his or her life. Father, we pray for your blessings on this, your word, as it goes forth tonight, that it might not return void, but that it might accomplish that which you please, and that it might prosper in the thing whereto you have sent it. For we pray it in Jesus' name. 
Amen. Now you recall that we have already looked at church number six, Philadelphia, in Asia Minor, and that was the faithful church. That was the missionary church. In church history, it appears to most closely parallel the time period from the Great Awakening here in America to the beginning of the 1960s, when the church in America took a definite turn toward the character qualities of the church at Laodicea. But the turn began a lot earlier than that, and this church came out when the church at Laodicea began to rear its ugly head just down the street. Philadelphia said in contrast to Laodicea. Philadelphia was the church that was humbly serving Christ. Laodicea was the church that was arrogantly being conformed to the world. You pick that up just as off the cuff, just reading through that letter to Laodicea. It was a church that was arrogant. It was a church that was proud. It was a church that was rich. Something else of interest to note is that Gnosticism was rampant in Laodicea. Now, there are many heretical things taught by Gnosticism, but one of the many heretical things that the Gnostics taught was that knowledge was spirituality. That's dangerous, folks. And there are a lot of folks today in churches that think because they have a lot of Bible knowledge, they're spiritual. And yet, if you watch their lives, they're as carnal as you can imagine. They believe that the more you knew the Gnostic secrets, the more spiritual you were. The more Gnostic secrets you knew, the closer you were to God. The more Gnostic secrets you knew, the more God was obligated to give you good stuff. Gnosticism was not about living for Christ, but about manipulating God because you knew the secrets. Gnosticism was self-centered, where Christianity was other-centered. Because of their worldly success, the Laodiceans thought that they were right on this subject, but they were in exact direct opposition to what the Apostle Paul taught in Romans chapter 12 about not being conformed to the world. Laodicea was conformed to the world. Laodicea was in the pattern of the world. Laodicea was a reflection, not of Christ, but a reflection of the world. Remember what Paul said in Romans chapter 12, verses 1 through 3? I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. When God calls Christians to be holy, to present their bodies as a living sacrifice, the Bible tells us that's reasonable. That is not an unreasonable directive from God. That you may prove what is the reasonable sacrifice. Have you done that? Verse 2, and be not conformed to this world. Now, when we just read through Laodicea a moment ago, you're reading about a church that thought they were rich. You're reading about a church that thought they were pretty well dressed up. And we'll talk about that in just a little bit. We're talking about a church that looked down on those poor guys, looked down on all those ignorant people that didn't have all the secrets that they had, looked down on all those people that they thought, well, they're not as spiritual as we are because they don't have all the theological training that we've got. It's very easy to fall into that trap if you've gone and studied a whole lot and learned a whole lot of things. This afternoon we had lunch with a man and his family who uh, go to the same church that my sister goes to down in San Antonio. And he told how God brought him out of apostate Presbyterianism 
When he was in his teens, when he was about 16 years old, he began to read the scripture. And he began to realize that what he was reading in scripture was exactly opposite of what he was hearing in his so-called church. And he began to ask some questions of the ministers, one of whom had his Master of Theology from Harvard Divinity School. He's a guy who had a lot of head knowledge. He'd gone to a big university. He knew his stuff. And here's a 16-year-old kid asking him questions of theology and challenging him on the basis of, of all things, the Bible. That's Laodicea. They thought they had everything. They thought they were the cat's meow. But Paul says, be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Not the packing your mind full of knowledge, but the renewing of your mind. There's quite a difference between the renewing of your mind, of which Paul speaks, and the packing it full of Gnostic knowledge, which the church at Laodicea thought they had. The one results in the arrogance of Laodicea, the other will come out in real life <coughs> proving what is good and acceptable and the perfect will of God. In other words, it will result in obedience. For I say through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you, huh, Paul's warning to Laodicea, I mean, this wasn't written to Laodicea, it was written to Rome, but it certainly is a principle that would apply to Laodicea, and no doubt the church at Laodicea by 96 AD had heard about the apostle Paul. To every man that is among you, not to think more highly than he ought to think. Don't think of yourself better than other people. That was what the problem was at Laodicea. But to think soberly, according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. He picks that theme up back down in verse uh, 16. Be of the same mind one toward another. Mind not high things but condescend to men of low estate. Be not wise in your own conceits. That applies to Laodicea. Rather pass to no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. If it be possible as much as life, then you live peaceably with all men. Laodicea was also insistent on its rights. They were the big guys. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place to wrath. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. For in so doing, thou shalt reap coals of fire on his head. Laodicea was built up on a big hill, and they thought they were impregnable, but they had one problem. They had to pump water into the city. And by the time the water got there, Colossae and Hierapolis on either sides of them, Hierapolis having the hot water, Colossae having the cold water. It was tepid and had gone through miles of pipe and it was dirty. And all the enemy would have to do is break the pipeline and the city would have no water. Pretty stupid when they thought themselves so smart, when they thought themselves so wise, when they thought themselves so good they're busy drinking gross water that Jesus says, I'm going to spit you out of my mouth. He compares their spiritual condition to the water that they were drinking. It's not the only parallel that we find in the passage, but if he thirsts, give him drink. For in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. Interesting. Drink cold water, heap coals of fire. Hot water. <laughs> It's a parallel which you see there in the church of Laodicea. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. John had also clearly taught against Gnosticism and worldliness. 
In 1 John chapter 2, beginning in verse 12, I write unto you, little children, because your sins are forgiven you for his name's sake. I wrote unto you, fathers, because you have known him that is from the beginning. I write unto you, young men, now listen, here ties in with what we talked about this morning. I write unto you, young men, because you are strong, number one, number two, and the word of God abideth in you, and number three, and ye have overcome the wicked one. We talked this morning about how the whole world lieth in wickedness and that the wicked one is the one who is in control of the entire world. It's not just that they don't have the right idea. They think everybody's nice and so they just got to correct them a little bit. The whole world lies in the wickedness of the wicked one. John writes about that here. You have overcome the wicked one, but he gives them a warning in the very next verse. Here's a way the wicked one can get through to you. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, he's only got about 96% of the Father in him. Is that what it says? You know, he, he loves God a whole lot, but just not quite enough yet. What does it say? If you love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. And you know, when you don't have the love of the Father in you, you're not going to obey him. You're not going to respect him. You're not going to honor him. You're not going to live a life before the world around you, which you're trying to please, that is clear and distinct. The love of the Father is not in him. That describes Laodicea. For all that is in the world the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes. Sex and covetousness and the pride of life. Oh man, there's a lot of stuff that goes under the pride of life. All those struggles for control is not of the Father, but is of the world. See, if the love of the Father is not in you, what's going to be in you? Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. That all comes from the world. That doesn't come from the Father. But he says, you know, it's a stupid choice to make. I mean, a really stupid choice, verse 17. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof. Interesting word that's used for passeth away. It means to be wrapped up in a burial shroud. In other words, the world is dead. It's not sick. It's dead. You don't wrap sick people in their burial shrouds. When they die, you wrap them in their burial shrouds. They're ready to drop into the hole in the ground. The world passeth away. It's wrapped in its burial shroud and the lust thereof. But, and here's the contrast with death. He that doeth the will of God. Ah, it's not a matter of believing the will of God. It's not a matter of knowing the will of God. The Gnostics knew a lot of stuff. He that doeth the will of God abideth for the next 10 years. Is that what it says? Now that one's already wrapped up in his burial shroud, but you've got another 10 years over here before we wrap you up and bury you too. It doesn't say that, does it? He that doeth the will of God abideth for ever. Wow. You know, as we've been looking at the seven churches here, only two of the seven churches have no rebuke from Jesus recorded against them, Smyrna and Philadelphia. Of course, we knew about Philadelphia. That's the compound of Philos and Adelphos, friendship kind of love, brotherly love. When we begin our study of the church at Philadelphia and Asia Minor, we saw a key connecting thread with the church at Sardis, which is also a connecting thread to the church at Laodicea. At Sardis, Jesus promised to give them white robes to the faithful few in contrast to the fancy colorful robes that were the product of Sardis. Now we have an even greater contrast concerning the clothing at Laodicea. 
Sardis had had those colorful robes, but they were told they needed white robes. But one of the big products at Laodicea was black wool. And they made very expensive and fancy, fancy black wool clothing and black wool rugs. And they made a lot of money at it that they produced there. But you know the greater contrary, they're not told that, you know, just buy white robes. Jesus tells them something else. They weren't wearing fancy clothing. They weren't even wearing black clothing. Jesus says they are naked. They're buck naked and they're proud of their clothing product. So as at least, they, there were a few of them that were going to walk in white. The rest of them were wearing fancy colorful clothing. At, at Laodicea, they're saying, you got no clothes on at all. The emperor has no clothes. Laodicea made black wool robes, but Jesus said they were naked. Laodicea was also known for something else. It was a very rich banking town. And so Jesus tells them how to spend their money. <laughs> Did you know God tells you how to spend money? I said, what? Yeah. God tells you how to spend your money. We have a good illustration of it right here. Jesus tells them to take their money and buy white robes. You know, we've talked a great deal in the past about the clothing of believers and how it tells you something about the character of believers. White robes frequently appear in the book of Revelation and also in the Gospels. White robes are given symbolically. They're usually seen in relation to pureness of Christ. But when they're seen on believers, they speak of us clothed in his purity and righteousness. Holy angels are also portrayed in white robes of holy righteousness and moral purity. That, of course, fits in beautifully with the first way in which the Lord Jesus Christ portrayed himself to Philadelphia, holiness, to the angel of the church in Philadelphia, right? These things saith he that is holy. You recall while we were going through that, we did an overview of white robes in the book of Revelation and the connection to various Old Testament prophecies. But in Revelation and in the Gospels, we saw white robes are the garments of martyred Christians. White robes are the garments of believers from the church age, raptured just before the Great Tribulation. Why do you explain the symbolism of being clothed in fine linen, clean and white? For it is the righteousness of the saints. That's in Revelation 19, 7 through 9. That's imputed righteousness. Righteousness that is imputed to the believer through faith. And at that point, you recall, we did a contrast between the doctrine of justification and imputation. Those are two key doctrines of the cross. The Reformation was built on the doctrine of justification by faith. But justification is not where you are made righteous. That's imputation. Justification is where you are declared righteous by God through faith alone in Christ. Then the other thing that we saw was the issue of the doctrine of works. And we saw that in the book of Revelation, it relates to two things. Number one, the proof and establishment of guilt. Whenever you find a judgment of works going on, it's because somebody's going to get proved guilty. And number two, the determination of levels of punishment and levels of rewards. And failure to understand that is what has led the Roman Catholic organization to the unbiblical doctrine of purgatory. We're going to study that later on. But over in Revelation 20, remember, it says, Another book was opened, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged out of those things which are written in the book according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged, every man, according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Now, when we get over to Revelation 19, I hope that we'll have time to look at dozens of passages in Scripture that talk about judgments of works. Not one of them deals with salvation, how you're going to get to heaven. Believers are always talking about how good they are and how God's got to let them into heaven because they're such good guys. We see a lot about judgment of works in Scripture. It mentions it a lot of times. Not once does it even give an inkling that this is so a person can be saved. It's so that they can be proved guilty. And then, on the basis of those works, 
to determine what level of fire they're going to get in the pit. There are four categories. When we talk about works, manifestation of those who have saving faith. Good works will be reflected in the life of someone who's saved. It doesn't save them, but it will come out. Number two, manifestation of those who do not have saving faith. Because not having saving faith will result in what you see. Number three, how God determines, not salvation, but the level of rewards for the believer. That's the Bema seat of Christ, the judgment seat of Christ. And number four, how God determines, not the lost status, but the level of punishment for the pagan. Revelation 19, 14, we can only participate in judgment of others if we're clothed in righteousness. You couldn't judge somebody else if you're wearing the dirty clothes. You have to have the imputed righteousness of Christ. And yet, in Revelation, we're going to be judging with him. There are three areas in which the Christian believers will participate in judgment. They'll be involved in judging the pagans on the earth. They'll participate in judging angels. And we're also supposed to be involved right now in judging sin in the church. That's why you must have the imputed righteousness of Christ portrayed in white robes. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 6, Dare any of you having a matter against another go to law before the unjust and not before the saints? Do you not know the saints shall judge the world? You're going to be involved in that, folks. You couldn't do that if you were dirty. You couldn't do that if you came in wearing slop-covered robes uh, that are soaked with sin. The worldling would look at you and say, Whoa, Jesus, why are you letting him judge me? You're going to judge the world. Sitting with Christ. Those sinners are going to come in front of the Lord Jesus. He'll say, so-and-so, come up here for a minute. You come up there. You're wearing a white robe of righteousness that was imputed to you by the grace of God and the blood of Christ. He'll say, now, we're going to listen to his testimony. And when he gets to some place where he was involved with you, I want you to give a word. And the guy goes along and he tries to avoid something and you say, your honor, on that occasion, I heard him blaspheme Jesus. On that occasion, I heard him talking dirty talk about all the immoral relationships that he had. And Jesus is going to call somebody else up and say, did you have more immoral relationships with this person? And they say, yes, sir. It says, we're going to judge the world. And if the world should be judged by you, are you unworthy to judge the smallest matters that is in the church? Second thing he says, know ye not that we shall judge angels. The demonic forces are going to stand before Jesus. I'm going to call up some witnesses. On such and such a day, tell me about the, the attack that you felt coming on you and the temptations that were floating through your mind. The thoughts that you were thinking, the pressure that you felt, the push, not just from the flesh, but you knew there was something else going on to look at somebody in the wrong way. Yes, Lord, I sense there was a demon doing that. Jesus says, here he is. We should judge angels. How much more of the things that pertain to this life? And if you have judgments of things pertaining to this life, set them to judge who are the least esteemed in the church. Verse 5. It's supposed to be going on in the church, too. I speak to your shame. Is it so that there's not a wise man among you? Not, no, not one that should be able to judge between his brethren. You mean you are all so carnal, you don't even have one person that can do this? That's kind of serious. We saw it in the Gospel and Acts as well. It relates to glorification, holiness, purity, spiritual warfare, the, the white robes, in contrast to the unclean spirits and unclean demons. We saw white raiments of glory at the transfiguration. We saw angelic clothing at the resurrection of Christ. It was white, as seen by the armed guards. The white angelic clothing at the resurrection of Christ seen by the women. The white angelic clothing at the ascension seen by the apostles. Clothing is what connects these last three churches in Revelation together. Sardis, white robes for the few. Philadelphia, holiness portrayed by white robes in the parallel passages. 
Laodicea, naked, desperately needing to be covered by white robes. Clothing, which portrays the spiritual condition of the church, is central to the letters of each of these three churches. And what did Jesus say to Laodicea? Because thou sayest, I am rich. You know, when I was in law school, I was a pulpit supply at a very nice church in a very wealthy neighborhood. And it was one of the most carnal places I have ever been. But they didn't have a pastor. They had a Scotsman who was on the board of elders who was later caught embezzling money and went to jail. But that was one rich church. I can remember one Sunday after church, one of the old men in the church walked up to me and just smirked. And he said, Mr. Spencer, this church is so rich and we have so much money in the bank that we could go on for a thousand years and never have to get one more penny from anybody and we could continue to exist. I thought, no, the church is already dead. It doesn't exist. You got a group of unsaved people here in this place. That's what the church at Laodicea thought. Thou sayest, I am rich. The Bible tells us it is God that giveth thee the power to get wealth. You don't have a thing that God didn't give to you. And if he gave it to you, it was for the purpose of using it for his glory and no other purpose. Oh yes, using it for his glory also means that you're going to meet your own needs. But he says, with food and raiment, let us be there with content. He doesn't even say fancy clothes like they got at Sardis or nice warm wool, dark wool clothes like they had there at the Laodicea. With food and raiment. He doesn't say fancy food. Let us be there with content. I am rich. In fact, I have such a fantastic business that I am increased with goods and have need of nothing. You know, I go down to the store and I walk through the store and I think, well, let's see, let's see what there's new in here. I wonder what I can buy today. And you walk through the whole store and you think, well, I got that already. Oh, what's over on that? Oh, I got that already. Ah, ah that, that, that sign of a shiny show. Let me see. Oh, no, I got one of those already too. Uh, I'll go down the street, down to Sears or down to, you know, Montgomery War. I'll, I'll go down to one of those really, really fancy stores, you know, Neiman Marcus or something like that. And you go all the way through the store and you can't find one thing you don't have already. I have need of nothing. Here's a church they thought they had everything. They had knowledge and they thought that having the Gnostic secrets of knowledge, that was going to, hmm, they were okay. That's what made them spiritual. They had money. They had so much money they didn't know what to do with it. I have need of nothing. They thought they had no needs. They got all the fancy clothes they needed. But Jesus says, Thou knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor. You see, they had fallen into worldliness. They were being lulled to sleep in the hot tub. The devil was massaging their shoulders. And they didn't know he was about to put his elbow around them and push their head down underneath. When you get lulled to sleep by the devil, that's what happens to you. It ties in well with what we've been studying in the morning. You're wretched. You are miserable. You think you got money? You are poor. The next word he uses is, and you're blind. 
Interesting. Poor, contrast to their rich, riches. Blind. Did you know that Laodicea was famous for a special Phrygian power, a powder, P-H-Y-R-G-I-A-N, not frigid like frigid cold, which when it was mixed up was used as an eye salve for different kinds of uh, eye infections. It was a great ointment that they had developed there and that they sold and it was exported not only to the region around them, but it was exported internationally. It was such a fantastic medicine. They were proud of the fact they could take good care of their eyes. Jesus says, you are blind. You don't even know how to take care of your own eyes, much less take care of somebody else's eyes. Spiritually, you can't see a thing. Oh yeah, physically, you're okay. But spiritually, you look at your eyes and they are just weeping sores with goo and pus coming out of them and holes in them where the blood is draining out and big tumors behind where they're pushing them out and bulging your eye. You're blind! All the things they thought they had under control. Jesus says, no, your eyes have no good for this problem. You're blind and you're naked. Oh, you export so much of that black wool and all the fancy stuff made out of it? You know, it looks like you sold it all and you don't have anything on yourself. Now that was a kind of stupid thing to do, wasn't it? So Jesus tells them how to spend their money. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire. Now when we see gold tried in the fire throughout scripture, it's where believers have gone through persecution and they come forth as gold. All the way back in the book of Job, probably the oldest book of the Old Testament. I counsel of thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire. You see, the fire purifies the gold. As the fire gets hotter and hotter and hotter, the gold melts to the bottom, and the rock in which the gold was found floats to the top. Yes, rock floats on top of gold. And the goldsmith skims it off until there's no more little pieces of rock anywhere there. The goldsmith can look in and see himself reflected in the beautiful surface of the gold. Jesus says, I want you to buy something. You think you got all that money? Okay, here's what to buy. Buy of me gold tried in the fire. That thou mayest be rich. You really want riches? That's true riches when you are being conformed to the image of Christ. Because that produces heavenly rewards that last forever. So you think you got those really nice black clothing, warm wool, fancy nice black blankets? You know what you need? You need to buy something else here. You need to buy white raiment that thou mayest be clothed and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear. Anybody who was a true Christian could look at the church at Laodicea and say, well, they're wearing a bunch of fancy outside stuff, but inside they're, they're buck naked. The shame of thy nakedness do not appear. And then he gives the third thing that they were famous for, and anoint thine eyes with eye salve that thou mayest see. You know, there's a hymn. Open mine eyes that I may see glimpses of truth thou hast for me. Until God opens our eyes, until he lets us see, until the Holy Spirit gives illumination on his word, we think we know, but we don't. They thought they knew. They were 
all the secrets of the Gnostics, they had a lot of knowledge. They'd pack their head full like that guy who was a, had a THM from Harvard Divinity School and didn't even know if Jesus was God. That boggles the mind, doesn't it? Open mine eyes that I may see. The white robes at Sardis and the fact that Jesus Christ is the Holy One at Philadelphia reminds us that we have the imputed righteousness of Christ. We are clothed in his righteousness alone. It reminds us that we're declared righteous in his sight. There is not an important truth that's connected to the remnant principle of scriptures beyond that. Although our works do not save us, those who are God's remnant will prove their salvation to others by the works of righteousness which they perform. You know, it's frequently seen in the Bible. God may let the rest of the culture slide, but he always keeps a few of his elect living holy lives, even in the midst of a corrupt society. But you know, at Laodicea, the church was in even more horrible condition than Sardis because we see Jesus standing outside knocking. The entire church had closed the door to him. You know, Dr. McIntyre in the Bible Presbyterian saw the apostasy of Laodicea coming into the liberal Presbyterian church years ago when they came out. And that's why that's written up there. Be ye separate. 2 Corinthians 6, 17. Be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you and will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. They came out. They fought the liberalism and the apostasy that characterized the modern church of Laodicea. At that time, I started the ICCC, the International Council of Christian Churches, the ACCC, the American Council of Christian Churches, which will be meeting here in October, to stand against the rotten apostasy of the National Council of Churches and the World Council of Churches, both of which had pushed Jesus Christ outside and closed the door. If you haven't read the history, there are copies of these books, and I brought some things up here for show and tell tonight. You're welcome to pick them up. This is great. A brief history of the Bible Presbyterian Church and its agencies. The men who came out, the persecutions that they faced, their stands for separation, their rebuke publicly of the apostasy of the World Council of Churches and the National Council of Churches. And they got pictures in here too. Man, we've got a lot of stuff in here. I know most of you have this. How many of you all have read this thing all the way through? Praise God, we got four people here who have read that thing all the way through. If you don't have a copy, pick one up. It's on the table out there and back tonight. Pick one up and read it. It will tell you about the church at Laodicea in the modern 20th century and now into the 21st century. You have to come out and be separate. But apostasy is what characterizes the so-called church at large today. This afternoon, I had the privilege of driving somebody by the one down the street here Sponsors lesbianism and homosexuality and the gay, bisexual, and transvestite and all those other weird groups. In fact, they have a rainbow flag out in their front yard, the church that this church broke away from, five blocks from us that away. Church at Laodicea. You know, there may be some believers in churches like that or in denominations like that. Why do they stay? Well, they say, we're rich. You know, look at all the stuff we've got. There's a rich church like that one that I told you about in Mountain Brook, Alabama. We got money. We, got we don't want to give up this stuff. Church at Laodicea. There were men in all the major denominations that came out. Let me show you a couple of other things here that I got. Here's one on the American Council of Christian Churches. There are copies in the back. How many of you read this? This tells you about the history of the 
American Council of Christian Churches. It shows you which ones are in the National Council of Churches. It tells you what the American Council of Christian Churches stands for. It gives you the doctrinal statement. It tells you the need for it because of the apostasy of Laodicea that was creeping in to all of the denominations. It lists names and places and people. Men who said we'll stand for the word of God no matter what anybody does to us. Another one back there. Here's one on the International Council of Christian Churches because they're fundamentalists all over the world. And our apostate so-called churches all over the world. This will tell you about the International Council of Christian Churches. Be sure to pick one up. It tells you the purpose, the formation. It gives you membership in the ICCC. It tells you who are affiliated with them internationally. Pick one up. Here's a great one. This is a resolution that was passed in 1958 when the International Council of Christian Churches met in Rio Petropolis, Brazil. Back then, did you know the World Council of Churches and the National Council of Churches was actually making overtures to the Communist Party? Let me just read you a little bit of this. You're going to see in this why they came out because it was the Church of Laodicea. The International Council of Christian Churches calls the attention of the Christian public to the first message addressed by the United Presbyterian Church in the USA to its 9,462 congregations. As the church union movement progresses, you know, that's called the ecumenical movement today, its leaders immediately, and the ecumenical movement is the church at Laodicea, its leaders immediately use their new position to promote peaceful coexistence with the communists. That was in their first message. In the meeting, 1948. Well, anyway, I'll let you read it. That's back there on the table. That's not only here in the United States. There are sound fundamentalists around the world who are standing for the truth of the gospel of Christ. I know all of you knew of John McKenzie while he was still alive, and Faith and Freedom Ministries in Australia. There's one back there about their history and why they put out the Faith and Freedom magazine and why they publish Bibles that are only King James, they will not sell anything else. They're in Australia. There's one back there on J. Gresham Machen and how he and Dr. McIntyre and all the rest who stood against the apostasy in Princeton got kicked out. Here's one. This one's free too. Back there at the back. The Death of a Church by Dr. Carl McIntyre. I hope all of you have a copy of that. This is an incredible book. It shows how the liberal Presbyterians have perverted ordination vows, the Holy Scriptures, the Lord Jesus Christ, the cross of Christ, the church, religion, reconciliation, civil rights, peaceful coexistence, poverty, sex, the immediate co context. Eugene Carson Blake, boy, I remember reading about him in college and just shaking my head and think, boy, that guy's going to hell. William Phillips Thompson, Charles A. Briggs, the Auburn Affirmation, George A. Buttrick, Independent Board Trials, Living Church. You ought to read this book. It's back there in the back. What it is, is the modern history of the church of Laodicea. But the scary thing is that a church which was once hot can become a lukewarm church. After a church, after being a church that was on fire for Christ, or a church that gave the cool, refreshing drink of the gospel waters, the devil always wants a church to become tepid and lukewarm, just like Laodicea. Now God will keep a faithful remnant, even in times of greatest worldliness and compromise and apostasy and internal rot in the church. But we always need to ask ourselves the question, are we one of the faithful remnant, or do we merely think that we're part of the faithful remnant? I can't believe it. Our time's up. We're going to have to spend another week on Laodicea. There's a lot more to say about it, a lot more things that are in here, a lot more parallel passages where we see a parallel between Israel, which we've been studying in the Old Testament, and how God dealt with them patiently, but how they got worse 
and worse and worse and worse until God finally killed them. He does that to individuals. He does that to churches. When a church goes Laodicean, Jesus tells them, whom I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. He still loves them. But compromising Christians are going to get their comings up. Compromising Christians are not just going to get rebuked by the Lord. He says, I rebuke and I chasten. The chastening of the Lord is never pleasant. And God will do it. And we talked about that this morning, how the end chastening is when a church as a body turns a wicked part of that church over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Whom I love, I rebuke, and I chasten, and scourge every son whom I receive. If ye be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then are ye bastards and not sons. Scripture is clear about it. Laodicea. This church once burned with fire for Christ. Once offered the cool, refreshing gospel. And people, God brought people here and made an impact worldwide. But you know, things can get comfortable. The church can think it's rich and has fancy clothes and has just about everything. They have need of nothing. They look around and say, what do we need, man? We got everything. And it knows not that it is blind and it's poor and it's naked. Gracious Heavenly Father, keep us from sliding into the pit of Laodicea. Keep us always fervent, on fire, and alive for the Lord Jesus Christ. Keep us from the compromise and the temptation of that comfortable, slimy worldliness. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, and the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world, and the world passeth away, and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God, doeth the will of God, abideth forever. Not wrapped in the burial shroud, not just lasts for a short period of time, got a, a, warranty, a, a limited warranty on it for ten years, abideth forever. Father, take the word of God and apply it to our hearts, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.